your own or run a business in your own time. Alright. Yeah. Almost all of you. So you guys are in charge. Set your own hours, make the big bucks, <laughs> rainbows and unicorns, right? Yep. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's not how it went for you. Zero for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's not how it went for you either. So, so tell me, what, what's it really like then? It's, it's not all rainbows and unicorns. Anybody ever uh, stay late to get something fixed? <laughs> yep. Anybody ever miss a kid's baseball game? <laughs> yep. Anybody ever had to fire somebody? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody ever fired somebody about two and a half years after they should have? <laughs> Anybody ever had their place of business ambushed by a federal agency holding badges? <laughs> Just me then. Okay. I'm with you there. I uh, asked me about it later. It was a, a total misunderstanding. <laughs> So, business is not always easy, right? We can, we can all agree on that, whether you're running a business, running a college, running an elementary school. It's important, but it's not easy. That is the bad news. So why do we all do it? Why do we work late, miss baseball games, get invaded in some cases by federal agencies, wearing badges, <laughs> scared our staff to death? <laughs> Passion. Passion. Passion, yes. Autonomy. Autonomy, yes. Passion, autonomy, serving people. I think we all have this sense crazy? that we can create. Crazy, <laughs> yes. Maybe we all have a sense we can create something that's better, right? We look at a, at a business and industry, we want to serve people by creating something for them. We want to create a better business, better school, better whatever it is. And we want to do that for our own sake, for our families, but we also want to do it for our community. In our case, that's Lake County. And Lake County is a great place to be. It is also the most economically disadvantaged county in all of California, still. That's also the bad news, right? So what does it take to get Lake County ahead? Some of the things we're already doing, some of it's just momentum. It's not regulations, it's not taxes. There's really only one way to grow a local economy, and that's what you guys all do as a business. You grow companies, grow systems that create value for the people around us. And then that, of course, creates taxes, and we can get nicer roads, and hire more police officers, and those are all really good things. But those don't come from anything other than creating value in business and the people around us, for the people around us, and also for people that come from the outside. If you spend more than about 20 minutes at Six Sigma, you have heard about grapes, you've heard about a lot of things that include good wine, and you've also heard about the Smiths. These guys are a returning piece from that presentation in 2015. <laughs> the Smiths are admittedly fictitious, they are normally beautiful, but they represent <laughs> 7 million people in the Bay Area that could all drive here on a Friday evening after work and make here for later. 7 million people is way more than we want up here. <laughs> it's about the, the population of my native country, Denmark. But that's a lot of people that if we create things that are interesting and valuable and inspiring and motivating and taste good, they come up here and some of them already do. Mr. Smith on a Friday evening, if he wants to introduce Mrs. Smith to a good bottle of wine, he has the opportunity of going to his local wine aisle. And they all look pretty much like that. It's kind of scary, right? If you're not in the business, we're talking at this table about how do you know if there's anything good in the bottle? You don't. You can read reviews, but do you know if the guy really likes the same stuff that you do? It's really hard. So Mr. Smith is overwhelmed by the wine aisle. He has an opportunity as an alternative to jump in his car with Mrs. Smith and come up to Lake County. This is one of our dinners up at the ranch. 
And Lake County has a whole different feel to it than the wine aisle in the Bay Area. I was down there with my kids yesterday, and it was really fun for exactly 12 hours. I love the Bay Area, but there's a sense of peace up there that's different than the Bay Area. So when we first started the winery, we had this strategy that we would create a brand and a vision on site. We're out there for the end of the two miles down the road. And so we realized that we were going to have to sell some wine in other places. So we went to New York, we went to Boston, Kansas City, Florida, and we set up distributorships because there's no way that we could get everybody to come out to the ranch and just buy the wine there. But a few people did come out and buy the wine there. We thought, how do they make the commitment? You can buy pretty good wine at Safeway. But they're already coming out and going to the ranch. And we've since made a pivot where we actually focus most of our energy at the ranch on the guest experience. I don't travel to Boston and New York and Florida anymore. I do tours and host guests at the ranch because people came. But that was a curious segment because we, we didn't know why they bothered. To come out to the ranch, they have to literally drive through Napa Valley where they make pretty good wine. And to our specific property, they have to probably drive around a cow on the way to the <laughs> We've been out to our place, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And yet they did. So we did a, a business school thing where we got a bunch of people together in a focus group called Voice of the Customers, very complicated. It's not that complicated. You just get people together and you ask them, a bunch of questions, and if questions are good enough, you can learn a lot of stuff. This was actually that focus group eight or nine years ago. We got people together and said, why are you all customers here? And we wanted to know, for a couple of reasons, most notably, we wanted to know if these are our best customers, and they were. We could afford to give them a free dinner. Some of these guys buy a lot of wine. We wanted to know where they come from and where their friends came from so we could get more. We learned from these guys, much to our chagrin, that there is more to life than good wine. You don't like to hear this when you get make wine for a living. So <laughs> Martin probably struggles with this idea too, that there is stuff to life other than good wine. And we asked them, my goodness, what is there other than good wine? And they said, well, those guys make pretty good wine. And you guys make pretty good wine, and so does Robert Mondavi. The truth is, a lot of times, especially in a social setting with the label goes away, we just want good wine. You know, there's, there's more to it, life, than the label, the details. We want to know what's right, but some of us honestly can't taste the difference. So we asked them, okay, well, if it's not all about the wine, what do you guys care about? And they told us they care about many things other than good wine. They told us they care about things like the earth. They care about people. They care about friends and family. They care about experiences. That was a big key to why they come out to our place, because it is a track. They care about animal welfare. A lot of the folks that come out to our place like that we raise the sheep there, and they're happy, and they're outside, and they're not in a cage. And if you ask parents, they care about a quiet place to talk. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> so back, back to Mr. Smith, the, the trouble is that not just the wine aisle looks like this hectic, complicated place. His whole life looks like that, right? His whole life is sort of hectic and somehow categorized and unnatural. And he wants to get away from it. That's why he comes up to Lake County. This is Mr. Smith's life and he needs a break. Then we started asking more questions. What does he want? Turns out he's willing to go to small shops, A&H general store or butcheries. This is a butcher shop in France. It looks like where I grew up in Denmark, where my dad would take us to the butcher shop and the greenery shop. We don't even have greenery shops here. It's like a farmer's market, but it's in an actual store. And the bakery. Why do people bother? They need a connection. And why do they bother coming to Lake County? They need a connection. Okay, great, but we're business people. They come to Lake County, they need an experience, they need a connection, this is very good. How do we get more of them? How did they hear about us? 
We asked this question way too late in our business. We did all the classic marketing speak, you know, the people, product, process. And we categorized our customers into age groups and into demographic and into interest. And we thought, great, now we know who our customers are. So there's no action point for that. What's the action point when you know what your customers are if you want more of them? You gotta know where they came from, right? We thought, okay, very well. Let's figure out where they came from. In the tasting room now, we see about 4,000 guests a year. And each one of them that are there for the first time, we ask them a very important question. And if we do it right, it's casual and they don't know why we ask them. We ask them, how did you hear about us? Because that question matters more than if they're age category 6 to 5 to 75, or if they drive a Buick or BMW. How did they hear about us? Because then we can go out and we can fertilize there. I'm a farmer, right? So if something grows well there, that's where you plant more things and you fertilize them. In our industry, that means if we know where people hear about our company, I can go out, shake hands, give out free wine to his babies, and then more people will hear about us. More people, more business, better business, more money for the county, right? The whole region grows. So, what do you think the people answered after about two and a half years of asking this question to about 4,000 people? How did they hear about us? Friends. Friends. Word of mouth. Word of mouth. Yes. Facebook. Facebook. Yes. All good answers. Driving by. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> we got so many people. <laughs> More than you would think. Right. <laughs> so the first one, and this is kind of gold, right? This is where the people come from, and. I bet it applies to some of your companies, although I encourage you to ask the same question. We even incentivize our frontline staff. We pay a certain bonus for signing up wine club members, for selling cases, and for asking this question and writing down the answer. I actually pay our frontline team a small fee for doing this because it's that important. Forty percent heard about us and came for the first time because they heard about us from another winery. So that's word of mouth, right? But it tells you two things. One is people make really short-term decisions. They came to Lake County, they went to a winery, and then they asked where to go to the others, but they're not that unsmart, because who else would you ask? As a result of this, I spend many a Friday afternoon going out to some of these other wineries and saying, Christina Bransfield, thank you so much for the pearl you sent this week. Here's a bottle of our pre-release Sauvignon Blanc. Does Christine do? She thinks with her husband. She tells more people about six weeks. And this is actually really good because as long as she honestly believes what we do, that means that when guests come up here, we bounce them around to all the good places, right? If they just bounce around wherever, there are some really good companies up there, and there's some okay companies. We should hold each other accountable for that, but don't send the guests to the okay ones. Hold those guys accountable for making better companies. If you're here, you're probably running a pretty good company. But we want to bounce the guests to the good ones so that they go home and just like Walt Disney said about Disneyland, do what you do so well that they want to come see it again and bring their friends. After another winery, the hotels and bed and breakfast. 60% of the guests did not plan what winery they are going to come to when they came to us first. They asked when they came. Where do you think is the other place I go around? And Big balls of wine to <laughs> hotels and B&Bs knows very well. On Friday, they're all going to get a bottle of our pre-release Sauvignon Blanc before it even hits the market. It's really good, so they're going to like it. Did you bring any? <laughs> I did not. I should have. Where's your wine? I know. I should have bribed you guys while I was there. <laughs> and then come the friend and the family. So those are about 80 percent, and that's all word of mouth. You know what we haven't hit yet is big advertising budgets, not even Facebook sponsorships. And then, to Tanya's point, the highway sign. We've got a pretty nice sign with a light on it. It drives 10% of our new business. That's pretty cool, right? I bet your sign drives some business too. That's how I found you. The first time. And I have literally this month sent three people to Star Gardens just this month. 
You and want some potted plants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then this elusive other, right? We all learned in business school, if we went to business school, that there's marketing, there's promotion, there's all these big things. That they're all very expensive. But if you market and promote something that's not speaking to people, it doesn't work. The funny thing about the referrals is nobody ever said, I heard about you from a friend or a hotel. They always said, they told me two tasting rooms and my buddy knows your place. It comes from all different directions, but nobody sees an advertisement that comes anymore. I think that used to work, but according to our numbers, two years worth of research, it doesn't, it doesn't drive traffic. So as much as I would like to think that a glamorous four-page write-up of wine enthusiasm would drive piles and piles of traffic, and there's many other articles, we love them, right? It's nice, we put them in our press kits. Tim Gordon is good to us. He gave us 90 point rating. He took good pictures. <laughs> got five or 10 guests out of this. Four pages from the second most prominent wine magazine in the richest country in the world. Five or 10 guests. One guy called from Florida and joined the wine club site on scene. That's great, we love it. But that's a very small percentage of that big list. And we had to get those data to do that. We actually spent up to $10,000 on advertising in big magazines when we first started. That's a really good way to earn money. And it apparently doesn't return any. Isn't that crazy? If I take $10,000 worth of wine or tickets to arrange the table dinners and send them to all our top customers, you can bet that makes a lot more waves than an article in the Wine Enthusiast magazine. Or certainly an advertisement. This is even editorial. What does matter is what we plant. It's all those little contact points for our individual businesses or for our counties. We sow it and we reap it. It's in a great old book. You should read it sometime. I like it. It's good business practice in there. Sowing and reaping. It works. I have to do my little soapbox. You can't read it, so I'm going to tell you about it. I walked into a, a Lake County business that will remain anonymous. And it was so touching that I wrote to the paper about it. And I've had more conversations about this topic than anything else in the last, who knows how long. So essentially, I get this famous, oh, we're doing this in our business, and it's hard. You know, it's just Lake County. It's a Lake County thing. And this gal wanted me to agree. Oh, yeah, it's just Lake County. It's Bash Lake County. And I did, I did not agree. I told you, you know what makes Lake County what it is? People like you. <laughs> for good or for bad. Whatever you tell people is what they believe because we flatter ourselves that Lake County has a bad reputation sometimes. Lake County doesn't have that much of a reputation. You go down to the Bay Area, we have a bunch of cycles that come up every year. And you go, we never heard of this place, this is so cool. We make our own reputation make our own reputation by what we tell the guests. This lady was startled when I told her this, but the math is right. We go, and in our case, we see 4,000 people a year, roughly. And you guys probably see some of you more, some of you less. But if there's 30 of us in here, and we connect with 4,000 people, there's 120,000 connections. It's a lot of people, right? So if we tell all those people, oh yeah, you know, I'm glad you made it, this is just Lake County. They go home, they go, I'm not so sure about Lake County. They're not so sure about it, so I'm not so sure about it either. <laughs> but if we tell them, I'll tell you what, why you're here, you, you're gonna wanna go to the saw shop. Oh, you guys just moved here? You're gonna wanna go to Tanya's place and buy the plants for your front yard. Computer problem, Mark's place. Mark fixes it every time. No, there's a bad computer guy somewhere, don't recommend that guy, right? <laughs> 120,000 connections out of this room every year makes a difference, right? A lot more than the people that flew by that wine article in Wine Enthusiast magazine. I can't tell you how many people never saw the thing. We're happy about it, we're honored, but that's not what makes the difference. What makes the difference is what we do, what we tell our teams and the experience we give our guests. Great example, high school mountain biking is a thing now. I wish it had been a thing when I was in high school. It was not, now it's a thing. There are 800 students in Northern California that come and race at different venues and they bring 2,000 parents. And they used to go up to Boggs Mountain and now they come out to Six Sigma. And the reason they come out to Six Sigma is there are a couple of teams here. 
They liked the rides. The coaches came out to the ranch and said, Boggs Burn, can we ride your place? I said, I like mountain bikes, sure. And then they said, can we build some more trails? It's getting good. Please. <laughs> I can coast from my place to the trailhead. This is perfect. And then they said, do you mind if we invite the director out to see this? Well, that's fine. And I'm thinking director, you know, track me, something like that. This is no track me. This is a total village that comes out. 2,400 parents and 800 students. Someone must be ants unless you've got more parents. Than <laughs> <laughs> the impact on Southern Lake County is great. But the way it came about is that a couple of coaches built some trails regular coaches with other jobs and nice people. And then they brought a bunch of people up here. They didn't tell the people, oh, you know, don't come to this place. And they said, we've got the whole trail. We made them ourselves. Come out and try them. And it does well for everybody else when they fill the hotel rooms here. And everybody says nice things. Back to the tourism ambassador program. So they're even educated to say nice things. That grows you stuff. And lastly, you never know who comes into your tasting room, right? You just never know. And you never know who you're bashing or bashing your region to or promoting your region to. One of those referrals that came to our place was a guy who used to be the president of Campgrounds of America. Perfectly regular, nice, humble guy. He just happened to be really good at what he does, which is build glamping resorts. And he came as a referral from a small winery in Lower Lake. Came in, he'd been in Lake County, he has a mandate from a parent company in France that builds clamping resorts with 150 tents, so like a small boat. And he was supposed to find a plot in wine country. So he started in Napa, he looked at Sonoma, those guys have so many regulations, he couldn't do anything with it. He came to Lake County, looked around, didn't find anything, decided, all right, I'll taste wine on the way out of town. At this winery where he's tasting wine, the guy goes, Hey, have you been over to Six Sigma? What are you doing? Sounds like it might turn out just fine. So this guy sends us an unsolicited note because of a great referral. I build glamping resorts. I invest six million dollars on a five-year lease. Would you like to talk about that? So that sounds interesting. <laughs> it will be about half the size of Kanaka as far as guest traffic. Post 400 guests or so on a given Saturday night. So we've been working with them for two years now on a contract. We started with a four page letter of intent. This attorneys Go is now a 42 page letter of intent to turn into a contract. But the point of the story is a nice referral turned into a really cool opportunity. And the good news is that there are lots of opportunities here. The bad news is that there's a lot of work to do. And the good news is that you all infect about 120 people a year, so all of us are the ones that are just cut out right to do it. Lots of comments. I think it's a great point. Oh. And let's discuss. Did I miss it? Thank you. I especially like the point. I especially like your point about that we can be the ones that give us ourselves a negative um, approach to, to our guests. I'm not from here. I've been here three and a half years. I'm from San Francisco. I came from a, from a perspective where we're the best. And I don't change that when I'm here, but I've seen the difference of some of the people that are here in Lake County. <clears throat> And I love everything you're saying. It's very similar to what I've been trying to do with the Greenview of like, no, it can be better. We, we are better than this. We have so much to offer. And look at the positive things that we have in Lake County instead of the negative things. That's why I'm here tonight. That's why I'm on this board. That's why I'm on the Lake County Wine Association board. There is a lot of great people doing great things here. And I think we just need to get together and work together and multiply this and build this. I'm digging everything you're saying tonight, really, it's really, yeah. It's also a matter of momentum, because it's not that nobody's been doing anything. When we came up for six, you know, 20 years ago, there were six wineries, and they're pretty good. Now they're 35, yeah. and that, that grows a region. It's not the end-all, be-all for a region. We need good restaurants, we need good hotels, we need And obviously we need more lodging stations. besides Twin Pines to start yeah. building some of this tourism business that I know the wineries are probably leading the way and the restaurants are lagging behind and the lodging is even 
probably lagging further behind, but I think it's starting to happen. And I think a lot of people probably in this room can see some of this traction that's happening and are getting excited about it. I know I am. Yeah. So awesome. We've almost doubled sales at the Green Gear two years since I got there. Yeah, they're here. People are here. Part of it's been selling your wife, too. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> When should the glamping project be? Yeah, that's fine. So it's in the permit process. So it's uh, still like and it's complicated, so it's complicated to permit. For uh, we, lodging, we, you know, for those 400 guests that are going to be shopping at. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we're going to give them a parking well, time. I know, I think we're parking. We'll probably need plans for the glamping resort, right? Yeah, it, it's in the permit process of the county. The county is doing nice with it, but it is, it's a complicated deal. Um, so it could be this spring, that's what we're hoping for. Otherwise, it's this summer. And then it goes up pretty quick after that because it's, you know, it's platform tents. It's all very little footprint, so there's not much to setting it up. And Josh? Just out of curiosity, what is the time frame? Have they given you kind of a, a tentative ETA on that? And the second question is, are you doing this in phases? Or are you trying to do one? It's in phases, so if we get going this, this late spring now, or, or mid-summer, we'll do the first 50 cabins and a, a little guest center in the middle. Okay. Uh, and then based on how fast that grows. The picture had a pool and stuff. That's not yeah, that's the, that's, I mean, they, they're not all identical, but that's the idea. It's, it's like a 2,500 square foot guest center with a restaurant and a small, uh, you know, small bar. <laughs> and then also a pool to go with it. That was one of the things that the county was creative and helpful. They said, well, we have some concerns about fire hazard. And then another guy from the county goes, well, just make the pool bigger. We can use it for fire That's right. <laughs> 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 So are they going to pay for the maintenance? Yeah. Or are they going to pay for the maintenance? Yeah. Or are they going to pay for the maintenance? Yeah, the deal we're making with them is like a lease. So we own the property. We lease it to them for 34 years. They build it, they operate it, um, and that way they take a lot of the risk and we add our our brand and, and existing customer base. So they take care of the pool and all that stuff? Yeah, they run it. Sounds like a pretty good deal. Yeah. <laughs> I think it would be a pretty good deal. I mean, 400 guests will be nice. Yeah. What is, it, what is the expected um, uh, uh, Daily, weekly rent for uh, for a customer coming in. So they start at about a hundred for a simple, a simple. It's you know it's furnished yeah. the tent. They're it's probably the fanciest tent they've ever seen. Per uh, night. Per night, yeah. And then one hundred and fifty for the really nice tents. And then they have a number of small cabins. Would be about two hundred. How, how big are they? Is it like a yurt? Yeah, like a small yurt. Okay. Yeah, they come in, in different sizes for two, four, six. <laughs> you guys probably want to get to dessert. So Christian, I got a question. Yes. What what would you what would you suggest as an as a next step for all the business owners that are in here who have used the traditional means of marketing themselves, print advertising, Facebook, and such? What you brought up there is is really very simple. It's very simple, but it's, it takes a mind, a change of your mind. Yeah. So what would you suggest as a first step on how to, how it's to great, proceed that It's way? a great question. Of course, you can't just steal our numbers. You're welcome to them. But your, <laughs> yours are going to be different. I, I think the number one thing to do is to figure out how to track what your numbers are. Uh, it's, it's key, right? We go as far as when guests come in the tasting room, we ask where they came from, we stick it on a spreadsheet, and then we actually put on there how much they spent. So I could tell you on a given time frame how much the referrals from Wyndham or uh, Twin Pine or whatever uh, are spending. And that way I can thank those guys for the business accordingly. So if, if, if there's one thing <laughs> I have an MBA, but I didn't learn this in my MBA. There, there was one thing that I would have done from the start that's sort of a tweak to, to common marketing is just to figure out some sort of measure system. Is, is where do your guests come from? How do they hear about you? Not who they are, but how they heard about you. And measure it and, and then figure out how to fertilize those, those sources. 
it sounds like that's a like a, a, a fundamental difference is you know when we're when we're marketing our businesses we're thinking about like individuals and how do I get that demographic and, how, and that's not really what's yeah. important what's important is who's coming in there and spending the money it is yeah and that and that I'll go back to the farming analogy we're tempted to think well we don't have enough customers from this sort of segment. Let's market to that segment. And I, I think that's exactly wrong. Uh, Tanya can explain this better than me, but if you have a certain area and you want to landscape it, you pick 25 different plants. Those 25 different plants, you put them out, you have a pretty good idea how they do. In our case, roses, rosemary, <laughs> lavender, <laughs> are killing it and a couple of the annuals that self-seed themselves. Well, the marketing concept of let's get that demographic is like me going out and buying rhododendron. I want rhododendron. Rhododendron are not killing it. Rhododendron are being killed in our environment because that's not what our environment appeals to. I think a brand is the same thing, or a region is the same thing. It appeals to a certain couple things, and you see what's growing, and you, you don't go, okay, well, the the roses and the lavender and the rosemary going great, so we got to put more marketing dollars into growing rhododendron. Well, the rhododendron is always going to be ugly in our place. Uh, check who your customers are. See where they came from. See what they're comfortable with, and that's exactly who you want to get more of, because they're already have proved that they they drive for their brand from whatever source they came from. I think that's a really valid point because I know coming from San Francisco, I had this mentality of like, well, I don't know where I'm going. I'm going to do what I know. And I had to be very honest with myself about what was working and what wasn't. Yeah. And learning who my customers are and what they want. Yeah. If you can try to force things down people's throat all day and it's, it's not the way to go. you got to see who's coming in here uh, four times a month, spending their money, and i got to make them happy. Yeah. And then I can put my spin on it. But I, you have to, you really, I think that's a really good point. You have to look and see what's growing well on your property or however you want to word it, but yeah. yeah and yeah. slowly and incrementally train because you, you can move a customer base slightly when you put your spin Once on Once you've it. got them as a customer. Right. But you've got to build them as a customer for then they're willing to go with you a little, a little way. Yeah. And that, that's where it's different than my plan analogy because I can't, I can't train a rhododendron. I can maybe select for the one that did a little bit better and get into breeding, but that's too complicated. We might as well just pick what works and, and do more and more of it. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.